This film is the story of my journey in the footsteps of this man, Captain Frederick Burnaby, to the Silk Road Citadel of Kiva in modern-day Uzbekistan. I began my journey checking out some of his favourite haunts in St. Petersburg, like the Alexandrensky Theatre. It's from here Burnaby set out on his epic journey in December 1875, taking the first leg by train to Moscow. This is Moscow's Kazansky station, gateway to Central Asia, from where Burnaby continued towards Orenburg and the far reaches of the Russian Empire. In what was the world's first Cold War, the Russian Empire had been expanding its influence towards British India, just as the British expanded towards Russia through Afghanistan. Central Asia became the playing field for intrigue and subversion, with colourful characters clandestinely visiting remote Silk Road city-states. The latest move in the so-called Great Game was Russia's annexation of Kiva, a caravan city and centre for slave trading. The Russians promptly banned Europeans from visiting their new territories, which must have piqued Burnaby, given what his nanny described in him as a most contradictious spirit. To the extent that unknown to the British authorities, he decided during his annual leave from the army to travel undercover to Kiva. Burnaby's account of the trip, and my companion for the journey, a ride to Kiva, was an instant bestseller and made him a celebrity. Finally, I arrive in Orenburg and prepare to cross at a remote Russian border post into Kazakhstan. But unlike Burnaby, who is an expert linguist, fluent in seven languages, for me it's more challenging. Right, I'm trying to get this right here and it's not easy. Um, I'm trying to write down in Russian what I need um, and also put the phonetics down as well uh, so I can try and pronounce it if, uh, if necessary. Um, so I'm needing a ticket um, on the next uh, train or bus to Aktobi um, today. Uh, Billet v Adin Kanyets Payavina Aktobi Sivodnia. Mm, doesn't sound very convincing, does it? Burnaby crossed the Kazakh steppes by horse-drawn sledge, whilst my bus is scarcely any more comfortable. Looking out across the frozen steppes, I'm reminded how Burnaby had plenty of character to cope with the challenge, reputed as he was to be the strongest man in the British Army. He'd carried two ponies down the stairs of Windsor Castle under his arms, like cats. He thirsted for adventure, having even ballooned across the channel. It's getting colder all the time, and I'm heading for the market to get kitted out for the next leg of the journey. Yeah, no, I like, I like, uh, like a little like this. Yeah? I think it's a good size. Yeah? Oh, what's this? Yeah, mm -hmm. the Nigalati. Okay. Mm. Good? Yeah. Okay. The local hero is Alia Moldagulova, revered for her exploits fighting as a sniper for the Soviets during the Great Patriotic War. She killed 91 German soldiers before dying in battle in January 1944. Burnaby's sledge party passed a little way to the east of the Aral Sea. At this station, a mural commemorates the occasion in 1921 when the fishermen provided 14 railway wagon loads of fish in response to Lenin's request to relieve urban starvation. Heading into town, I can see something is wrong. So I'm now here in the uh, town of Aralsk, and uh, this place pretty much uh, defines the uh, defines the term grim, I think. Um, so what's behind me used to be a harbour, um, but with the disaster, environmental disaster, that's the drying up of the Aral Sea. Um, the sea is now, well, a long way from here. In fact, I'm going to find out soon. I've hired a driver, and uh, we're going to drive uh, from the town across the, uh, across the seabed and see exactly how far um, the sea has retreated from here. Outside the town is an abandoned secret airbase where the Soviets flew in material for their biological weapons testing program. This was conducted on an island on the Aral Sea, except the island is no longer an island. And frantic cleanup efforts have taken place since the sea retreated. Rusting ships eerily dot the landscape.
So here now I'm actually at the shore of the Aral Sea or, or, or where it's retreated to. I think we must have gone about 70 kilometres probably um, since the uh, since the harbour at Aralsk before we actually reached the sea here. Probably about 10 kilometres back, um, the stranded ships, the ship's graveyard. Um, so for a sea like this, and now I can see it, you get an impression that it is a is a sea. It was once the fourth largest inland sea in the world. Uh, to have retreated 70 kilometres on this side, um, shrunk to almost one quarter of its size, is uh, it, you know is unbelievable and uh, not surprising the environmental cast catastrophe that it's caused uh, with the fishing, um, with the desiccation of the land around it, the sandstorms and the, and the health problems that have followed for the people here as well. So uh, quite an amazing sight to, to finally see it now. The only hotel in town is a crumbling Soviet-era relic. As you can see here, the, the view from my uh, uh, from my beautiful hotel room. Um, a couple of uh, kind of comfy beds here. Lovely, uh, lovely general, uh, lovely general uh, decor scheme as well. Uh, beautiful. Um, got an ensuite bathroom as well, actually, which is nice. Let's have a let's have a look in there. <laughs> yeah, that's. Uh, that's fantastic, isn't it? We're on the road again and heading into Burnaby's biggest obstacle, the Kuzlokum Desert. Since leaving the railway, Burnaby had been travelling in horse-drawn sleighs between ramshackle coaching stations. Now he crossed the Siradar River to approach the Kuzlokum Desert on horses and camels he had purchased. This route could only be attempted in winter when the snow provided a source of drinking water for man and beast. However, it meant terrible conditions would be endured by the party in one of the harshest winters in living memory. Even Cossack soldiers were found frozen to death. We have a problem with our jeep, but luckily in the last village before the desert, a government school building program means we can borrow a welding torch and make running repairs. All children in Kazakhstan must now learn English at schools like these. Problem fixed, we're soon on our way into the desert again. Burnaby's companions are Nazir, his faithful but diminutive Tartar manservant, a cunning looking Kyrgyz guide wearing a padded yellow dressing gown, red pointy boots and a scimitar, and a Turkoman camel driver he has to beat to ensure he packs the equipment carefully. So I'm here in the Quislam Desert now. Um, I'm probably about uh, 30 miles from the border of Uzbekistan, and unfortunately, this is as far as uh, I can go in this direction. So uh, this border's closed, I'm not allowed to cross here. And also it's a notorious uh, smuggling area as well for drugs from Afghanistan. Um, so it's not necessarily somewhere that um, I want to be caught wandering around near as well. Uh, but you can see we've got a stunning day out here in the desert. It's still quite cold um, and uh, a little bit of mixed feelings now. So incredible to be, uh, to, you know, to be on the ground that uh, Burnaby crossed all those years ago out here in the middle of nowhere. Um, but uh, he didn't have so far to go now to Kiva, but I've got to retrace my steps and go the other way around the Aral Sea and enter Uzbekistan uh, through, through its western border um, to actually get round to the other side and uh, pick up his track again. So. About here, they joined a merchant's caravan, also heading for Kiva. It's a trusty steed that's got us this far up to the border. Okay. Hello. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's uh, like a uh, video. Ah, video. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. My detour to reach the same desert to Uzbekistan is even bigger than I thought. I have to travel east to Tashkent and then double back to Nukas thanks to a bird flu outbreak. Nukas, the capital of the Autonomous Republic of Karak al Pakistan, was established as a Soviet planned city out in the remote corner of the desert. The idealised planner's dream of the 1960s today looks pretty desolate, but there is one enormous surprise here. The Republic is so remote that the works of artists the Soviet Union deemed subversive were hidden here under the noses of the provincial authorities, taking advantage of their ignorance of art, and are now in the Savitsky Museum. When the Soviet Union collapsed, astonished American buyers arrived in private jets in unsuccessful attempts to snap up the collections. The painters of these pieces spent time in the gulags. I'm now picking up Burnaby's trail on the other side of the border. Deep in the freezing desert, Burnaby found his group, even after much vigorous kicking, could only be raised from a night's slumber by taking down the tent and stamping out the fire. 
Burnaby's route of march out of the desert just missed these rarely visited ancient crumbling mud-walled fortresses. Built three centuries before the birth of Christ, they were outposts of the ancient kingdom of Corsum. Wine presses found during excavation show as home of one of the earliest winemaking centres in the world. The area's fertility was destroyed by Genghis Khan's Mongol hordes, who stormed these forts, slaughtered the population, smashed the canals and laid waste to the crops. The hills behind are the obstacles marking the end of Burnaby's desert crossing. Good morning. <laughs> so here we are in the uh, Kazilam Desert. Uh, just spent a pretty uh, reasonably cold night in the in the yurts behind me here, and um, yeah, it's uh, sort of snowing, spitting, sleeting. I think um, and a reasonably cold wind out here as well. I'm about to spend the whole day on camelback um, out in the desert that Burnaby crossed behind me there. Great. Burnaby suffered from serious frostbite, something I'm only just recovering from after a Himalayan climbing expedition earlier in the year. He had tricked his guide into coming to Kiva by promising to buy a horse from his brother, the only way he could get the guide to deviate from the pre-approved route to a Russian fort further downstream. The Russian conquerors of the region were not his only worry, for 35 years earlier another visiting British officer noted, he who enters Kiva abandons all hope as surely as one who enters hell. A friendly Russian had warned him that the Khan of Kiva would very likely order his executioner to gouge out his eyes. So behind me now is the Strongman Gate, or the East Gate. This is where Burnaby entered the city, the inner city, after riding through the bazaar. It was a place for public announcements, it was a place for executions, uh, punishments, where runaway slaves had their ears nailed to the gates, and uh, the main entrance from this side of the city. This was one of the great slave markets of Central Asia. Slaves, including European Russians, were held in these pens before being sold. So behind me here, the ancient caravan city of Kiva. Um, Burnaby's destination and mine, great. And uh, tomorrow, I'm going to go to the palace where uh, he had his audience with the Khan. Fantastic. Burnaby had sent a letter ahead to the Khan and was put up in a merchant's house and taken for a bath as he eagerly awaited news of his upcoming audience. So it's a cold and frosty morning in Kiva now and I'm on my way to uh, trace Burnaby's meeting with the Khan at the palace. Horsemen arrived to escort Burnaby to the palace. Crowds thronged the narrow streets to see the Englishman and officials freely lashed them with whips if they came too close. So behind me you can see the square in front of the Khan's palace that Burnaby crossed, the place of execution, and there's the gate on the other side that Burnaby entered the Khan's palace through, guarded by 30 or 40 soldiers armed with scimitars tucked in their belts. Corridors and courtyards led to a dome-shaped tent pitched on a circular raised platform. Once inside, Burnaby described the Khan's face as being of a broad, massive type. After weeks of travelling, without seeing another Westerner, I'm almost at my journey's end. After travelling so far, it's a fantastic feeling now to be at the very spot where Burnaby had his audience with the car, in a yurt pitched on this uh, raised platform here. Until now, I've always felt maybe a couple of steps behind Burnaby, but to actually in the exact spot and to be able to read Burnaby's account of his conversation with the Khan, it's a fantastic feeling. Brilliant. However, as soon as the Russians heard Burnaby was in Kiva, they sent an escort to return him the way he came. It's also time for me to leave Kiva's palaces and wedding parties. I have one last stop to make. Burnaby wanted to continue to Bukhara, another former Silk Road city-state. A few decades earlier, two British officers, Arthur Connolly, who coined the term the Great Game, and Charles Stoddart, were imprisoned in the Khan's infamous bug pit for years. What happened next illustrates how disastrously Burnaby's journey might have turned out. So here in the square behind me, the Registran, Stoddard and Connolly were marched out, made to dig their own graves, and while a band played from above the gate there, they were executed and buried where they fell. Burnaby returned safely to a hero's welcome, but ten years after his journey to Kiva, his lust for action led him, again without the blessing of his superiors, to be among a thousand soldiers engaged in a battle with dervishes at Abu Klay in the Sudan. Here he was speared to death through the throat. I'm now preparing in Durban, South Africa, for a journey by motorbike to Sudan to find the battlefield and Burnaby's last resting spot.
I hope you can join me for the next adventure. It's going to be a blast. <laughs>